As Americans, we have what we call the Bill of Rights. It's a good thing. In the Scriptures, and according to the Gospel, we live in a kingdom as believers. Do we have rights? Let's talk about Paul and his rights today in the Word. Good morning, and welcome back to Today in the Word. Hi, I'm Glenn Schaefer. Thank you for joining us here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to be in verse 15 through 18, just a few verses today, so I want you to follow along with us. However, I think this is an important subject for us as believers, so I'm using these few verses for this entire segment. I recognize that we live in a nation with its foundation on what's often referred to as a Bill of Rights. Very appropriate. And the reason for our Constitution and the Bill of Rights is that we're not under a king. <laughs> we're not under, I want to say not under tyranny, <laughs> but you get what I'm saying. We do not believe that there is a king. In fact, in the Scriptures, that was not God's best choice and was not His choice for Israel. They desired a king, and God said, it'll bring leanness to your soul. It's going to cause high taxation, and it's going to bring about you as servants. Well, kings always do that. And the more our nation drifts away from the Constitution and Bill of Rights, that's what we find. However, that's not what I want to talk about today. I do want to compare it to the kingdom that we live in, and we who are believers, we have a king. We don't have a Bill of Rights in the kingdom of God. And I want you to make that distinction. I don't want us to carry that over into the, our kingdom experience with Jesus as the head of the church. So Paul understood even biblically there was a right that he had to receive funds and finances and be supported in preaching the gospel. He makes a very clear case that we've already talked about, that God did not want them to muzzle the oxen, but let him tread out the corn and to be able to eat while he did. And he uses that analogy to pay those who labor in the gospel. And Paul even writes to Timothy and says, those who labor in word and doctrine are worthy of double honor. So he's not against this. But as an apostle, he's going into Corinth and he's wanting to be able to exercise the place that God has given to him and laid upon him to preach the gospel so no one could say he did it out of financial exchange. So whether that ever is our experience or not, that has to be our heart. Let's look at verse 15. Follow along as I read. But I have used none of these things. He's talking about rights, that he's just built a case that they are to have the ability to receive this support, and it's right. He says in verse 15, let me start again. But I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things, that it should be done so to me, for it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. That's pretty strong. What is he seeing that we need to see? He's making the case that I'm going to preach the gospel because that is laid upon me. He said, it's not my choice. <laughs> I guess it is, but you get what he's saying. It's been laid on me. I have no other option but to preach the gospel. In fact, listen to what he says. For he says, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. So he says, I, It's like I almost don't have a choice. This is laid upon me, and uh, that's my responsibility. That's what I'm called to do. However, he said, The choice that I do have is not to receive funds from you, even though I have all the rights to do so. I have a right, if you want to use that term, in the Scripture, according to the Old Testament, as he applied that to those who labor in the temple. Do you not know they eat of those items of the temple? He says, so it is for those who labor in the gospel. He said, even as the Lord commanded, those who live by the gospel should be paid by the gospel. So he's got the command of the Lord. He's got the command of the Old Testament. He has that right. But Paul's heart is so much of the apostolic heart for the Christians in Corinth or anywhere else that he would go where this was of necessity. He said to the church in Philippi, you have blessed me 
He said, I have robbed from other churches at one place. He said, you have provided for me when nobody else did. So it wasn't that he was afraid. It wasn't that he never received funds, but he wanted to be able to boast in the right way. This is not prideful boasting in one sense. It's being able to say, let me tell you, the gospel is so important in my life. I've come to share the gospel with you. He says, for it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. What was his boasting? Was his boasting that he was preaching the gospel? No. His boasting was that he was doing it without pay. The reason for that, in Corinth, just like it is today, there would have been people who would have looked down on him because he was not in that circle of receiving finances. In fact, you're going to see over in 2 Corinthians when we get there that that's exactly what happened when they opposed Paul and thought he wasn't as important of an apostle as the false apostles because they had a well-oiled machinery organization where they were collecting funds and people were submitting their money to them. Therefore, they must be the real professionals. Paul is always in prison. <laughs> Every time we need him, he's in prison. And he's going through these difficult times. Surely there's something wrong with him. He's not that flamboyant. He's not charismatic. He's not that great of a preacher. And so they really looked down on him, and he suffered for that. But he said, in that weakness, you remember he said, that's where Christ is made strong, not a dependency upon the flesh. Now, what Paul was seeing was his spiritual authority. You're going to see what he talks about this in just a moment. Spiritual authority that came because he walked in the measure that God wanted him to. And God was leading him here not to receive any funds that he might boast. And that word boast means I can say I came to you as a father and it wasn't because you gave me an offering. This was not transactional love. You know, in the body of Christ, we're not careful. It's transactional. You do this for me, I'll do that for you. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Well, that's in the world. That's not what the kingdom of God is all about. And he says, but as far as preaching the gospel, I don't have an option. It's laid upon me the necessity that I must preach the gospel. But verse 17, he says, for if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. He says, if I just do this because I believe I'm called to do it without any kind of financial gain, he said, I'll receive a reward. Otherwise, it is futile in that sense of my boasting. And I believe there is something to the attitude of the heart in those of us who labor in the kingdom to be of this mindset. It doesn't mean that those who labor in the gospel will not receive remuneration. It doesn't mean there won't be provision. In fact, over the years, I have seen God's financial blessings. I remember sitting in my office in the 80s with a young man who no doubt was called into a five-fold ministry, and I saw the gift of pastor on him. And to this day, when I think about it, I have this sense of grief in me. And I remember sitting in my office, and he was younger, he was coming into his late teens and his early 20s, and I would have probably been about 30 years old. And he said to me, I know that I'm called, but I choose not to go that route because I want finances for my family. And if I go that route, I will not receive what I need. And I remember being grieved over it. I look back on life now, after these 35 years, and God has provided for my wife and I. It's over aggregate of time. It's not quickly, it's laboring. I know when we first came here, I was 25, my wife was 23, it was a denominational church, met with the board of deacons and they were discussing what our pay would be. And my wife, not because she was less committed, uh, I grew up in a pastor's home. I grew up seeing sacrifice. And she said to me, she said, honey, don't just settle for anything. <laughs> and uh, I knew that she wasn't less committed than I was. But, you know, she's the wife, and she needs to know that I care for her too. And really, she knew that I would do it for nothing. <laughs> and I don't want to ever lose that heart. I'm grateful for the provision over the years. God has taken care of my family, and He will continue to take care of us. I'm so grateful for the generosity of those of whom we labor among. But i got to tell you, I don't want to lose that heart. 
that says I'm called to preach the gospel and labor in it. You see, the Corinthians would have looked down on somebody who worked with their hands. Today, we do the same thing. When we see somebody with a job outside of getting their paycheck from the church office, we say they're no longer in the ministry. I grieve over that. My good friend, Tom Williams, when he and Gene moved to Claremore, along with six other pastors between October of 86 and January of 87, Tom had a trade. He had resigned a church. He and his wife had resigned a church in Electra, Texas, and moved here because they believed that God had told them to come and be a part of what Glenn and Amy were doing. We had six pastors that came in during that time. And because he had a trade, Tom went out and started a painting business. He was coming out of a bank in Tulsa in which he had gotten a contract. And a young man, now a banker, walks into the bank, seeing Tom in his paint clothes, looked at Tom and said, Tom, I didn't know you got out of the ministry. And Tom came and shared that with me. And I said, oh, Tom, <laughs> you'd have to quit breathing to not be a pastor. Well, those of you that know Tom, we walked through that death with him this year, and I can tell you, that Tom no longer has to be a pastor or needs to be a pastor because in eternity it's not called upon. But as long as he breathed, he was a pastor. And he imparted to so many people in so many ways. And the life of Christ in him flowed out. You see, that's the reward. Not whether or not we're seen as getting a paycheck. And that's what Paul was trying to say. Because it's looked down upon among the Corinthians. If you work making tents, you can't be a somebody. You're no special man of faith. You're no person of influence if you're out there making tents. Well, that's a waste of time. Well, I get that in the mind of men, but in the purpose of God, Paul knew what he was doing to go in and labor the gospel that the authority that he was given would be able to be exercised. So when he says there in that verse 18, what is my reward then that when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. He knew he had a spiritual authority and he could demand it and he could even influence people. And he said, yeah, because we know that he did receive funds. We know he was supported, but there were times especially to the Corinth. He said, I'm not going to abuse the authority I have. Paul understood spiritual authority. When he wasn't seen as some grandiose guy, he knew he was moving in Christ's authority. He knew he was walking in the call of God. And it didn't matter if people looked down on him. I remember when I went into Honduras in the middle 80s, our good friends uh, who were missionaries down there, we went and labored there, and we were teaching along these subjects of humility and serving, that God takes the greatest servant and He pours His life through them, and that in order to be uh, something in the kingdom, we must be the greatest servant. And I, I taught about these things, and the people, I didn't know it, got upset. In fact, there's one young man who was dating a, a doctor, a physician, and he came to the pastor there and said, hey, Glenn, what Glenn's teaching, if I did that, I would never be married because she'd look down on me if I'm out there mowing my own grass. If I'm serving people uh, at the church facility, I, she would look down on me. And he, they said, he doesn't know our culture. Does he know our culture? That won't work. Well, I'm going to tell you, every culture is contrary to the kingdom of God. <laughs> There's so many things in our culture that's contrary to the kingdom of God. And it was true in among the Corinthians. What Paul was doing was contrary. Did you know that message of servanthood and humility and brokenness was so opposed in San Pedro Sula? There with our dear friends, there was a lovely church facility built in their backyard by these English-speaking Hondurians. Wonderful facility made out of wood and beautiful fixtures inside. They got so upset. They said, you can't have Glenn come back and preach because if he preaches that, we'll be nobody. <laughs> Which now makes me wonder if they were even converted. It doesn't sound like they even understood the kingdom. Did you know they got so angry? They came and tore that church building down 
and turned that wood into furniture and sold it and said, we'll not have a church there. Well, the building is not the church, hello. But that's how angry they were about what Paul was proposing here, that he would even use the right that he had and he would be a servant for the gospel. Why? He said, so he would not abuse his authority. Here's what I want to leave with you today. Remember what the call of God is upon your life. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It doesn't matter whether you receive remuneration for it or not. It matters whether or not you're obedient to the call that God has for you and you walk in your measure today in the world.